All right, guys, today I'm going to say something that will probably make a few of you maybe upset, but I think it is worth genuinely talking about, and that is that we are being played by big EDC. Now, I'm not sure there's actually a big EDC or something like a cartel out there in the EDC community that is lingering to take advantage of us strictly for money. However, I do think that there is a congruent flow and a trend, and I think this is um, something that is rather widespread, not just in our community, but I feel like with any community out there that is uh, susceptible to the hype beast nature, and for those who don't know what hype beast means, it basically just means that things that are very popular, things that can be used to exploit people that just simply chase after the newest, hottest trends, whether that's the newest colors, the newest designs, the newest steels in our particular region or our particular community, or really whatever. Um, hype beast culture, I think, is denigrated, especially from you know the fashion and clothing industry down into every other other really community out there and I think it's honestly pretty toxic and heavily driven by the you know companies within the within the different um, you know resulting communities whether that be car communities knife communities gun communities whatever there's many communities and I'm sure multiple of us like myself run in multiple of these communities so we definitely are aware and see it However, today I thought I'd take a talk and look at some of the ways that Big EDC is exploiting us so that we can properly avoid it. So the first one for me, and I think the biggest one that really disappoints me, is the fact that most knives, and then of course there are brands, especially Spyderco, that tend to buck this trend, but there are a lot of brands out there, knife companies and such, that really do a very half-baked job at making sharp knives out of box. And what I mean by this, and I think one that was a very poignant example, is I recently bought this limited edition um, Blade HQ exclusive Protec Malibu, and I was honestly very disappointed in this knife initially, at least as far as a knife and its cutting performance goes. Because regardless, like the action is very nice on it, this is true, but the action on it's very nice and this is true. And you know, it feels good to use, it feels smooth and clean, but when it comes down to a knife, a knife is designed to cut things. And so when we look at that, um... so imagine my surprise when I did, my sharpening on this knife because its performance as far as cutting goes was pretty lackluster and found it to be around 25 degrees per side angle on this blade. So unfortunately I was not super stoked about that and once again I think it's like one of those things where I think Protec is really banking the Malibu on being a very smooth, very clean action. And I will give it that. It is pretty smooth. It's pretty clean. It does run on bearings, so I would expect that. But it's a nice action, a good lockup, or good enough lockup, I should say, um, to be a decent knife. But the problem is, you know, at the end of the day, you buy a knife for its cutting performance. So if it can't cut things well, then why really be a knife? So anyways, I, I draw this point that I think a lot of companies, especially with sprint runs and limited editions, prioritize the you know limited or rarity or the cool factor, it, it factor of that knife over the actual performance of the knife, which is certainly a realistic problem. Now, another point kind of leading into this, because this is a limited edition, but actually talking about limited editions, I feel like a lot of knife manufacturers push a lot of blades, once again, even half-baked blades and designs as sprint runs. And I feel like sprint runs started out as a really good idea to get, you know, kind of trial or to see if market acceptance would work is kind of just turned into a trend for companies, especially Spyderco, because while I do love Spyderco for putting good edges, using good steel, good heat treats, uh, there's a lot of really good points to um, Spyderco's. They are the worst about making sprint runs. Now, to be fair, they are kind of like the, at least in the knife world, they're kind of like the founder of sprint runs, so I can't, can't blame them too badly, but it still is very frustrating to see, you know, a knife company that is, you know, 
making something for a specific sprint run because in my opinion limited edition slash sprint runs were always designed to like i said test market acceptance test you know different varietals of a blade or handle shape or you know particular materials and see once again is the market going to accept this are they going to like this do they want this but at this point it's just kind of become more of a tool that people use to flex on other community members saying like oh i have the rec edition of the spider co shaman you know like stuff like that where it's just unnecessary and then you see you know you go to ebay and places like that or even on the facebook you know um, different knife groups or blade forms you, you will see you know the rec editions of manix twos um, shamans and stuff like that they are going for like over 400 dollars. and so we're talking you know a blade that is not much different from a standard you know a standard spider co going for exuberant amounts of money just because it's limited edition so anyways sprint editions are another way that big edc offers you the same if not less value for your money that a normal standard variety of a knife would offer but for more money substantially sometimes and once again not every limited edition is going for top dollar this in particular sprint run from the cutlery shop is not cheap um, by the way but also not super super expensive i want to say i spend about 250 on this one which when you look at a normal spider co paramilitary 2 is expensive because a normal paramilitary 2 is you know around 150 160 dollars so it's about a hundred dollar markup however i bought it primarily because I wanted the CPM Rex 45. So that's the reason I ended up pulling the trigger on it. So the last one, and ironically, both of the knives that you see here are actually guilty of it, is, in my opinion, the kind of push for titanium, carbon fiber, Ultem, you name it. Like there's so many different, you know, like handle slash, you know, blade materials that are pushed out there. And I think in this one, I'm primarily referring to, you know, like more handle materials here, but there's this heavy push that, you know, if your knife isn't a good knife, unless it has things like carbon fiber, Ultem, titanium, or, you know, other different, very, you know, kind of bougie materials that objectively speaking, like when you take this, you know, um, titanium linered version of, or not version, but um, Emerson, and you put it up against, you know, an aluminum handled or, you know, even steel uh, linered um, knife, you're not really gaining anything extra. Like you might save like a half an ounce overall, if that, like honestly, most of these genuinely really are not any lighter than their steel alternatives. And it's just because when you, especially when we're talking about like steel versus titanium liner locks, the thickness of the steel really creates a very high diminishing gain. So like the thickness of the steel versus the thickness of the titanium is something that's more noticeable when you do a full frame lock because a frame lock is, you know, far much, it, there's far more metal involved in your handle material. But when we're talking about, you know, something that's less than an eighth of an inch thick, there's very, very marginalized gains with choosing titanium. So it's really one of those things that becomes more of a clout chasing or or kind of a you know flex that like oh your knife doesn't have carbon fiber you know as its show scale or as its off scale you know you don't have ultem on your handle like once again these realistically have no real application in EDC and don't get me wrong if you like a particular knife that has a particular handle design then you know far be it for me to tell you you know not to purchase it but it's kind of one of those things like this um, Heretic Manicor X you know in particular I really don't care too much about the carbon fiber the fat camo carbon fiber um, but I just really like the overall premise I like the Boba Fett kind of styling to it so I think that that is what makes it very unique and collectible in its own regard but but bringing it down, like, there's a lot of people that, you know, like, they specifically go for things like titanium, and I'm partly guilty of it with things like my watch here, you know, like, I like the fact that Apple made this a titanium and sapphire watch, like, this was the first um, titanium watch that Apple made, and so, you know, I'm, I'm partly guilty of it, even um, my Apple card, for those who don't know, um, Apple makes a physical credit card, and if you get the Apple card, then it is a, like, titanium card, so, 
you know, I, I can be a little bit guilty myself of chasing like, oh, premium materials must, you know, like equal nicer. And it's, it, once again, it's really just one of those things that makes you feel better. And if you like it, you like it. But it really, like, honestly, there's no difference between a titanium credit card and a plastic credit card. They're both ways for you to waste money. So, I mean, like, you know, when you look at it, in the end, like peak consumerism, arguably, is this chasing like titanium credit cards, titanium watches, titanium phones, like everything titanium. It's highly arguable. There's really no like highly diminishing gains, no benefits. It's going to function just as well as plastic credit card has a G-Shock watch as a, you know, normal or like, you know, Samsung Galaxy phone that's not titanium, right? Like there's no real honest benefits to the titanium, the carbon fiber, the Ultem, any of that stuff, you know? So at the end of the day, you know, buy what makes you happy because in fairness, in my opinion, personally too, it's one of those things where I think people should be conscious of money and cautious with their money, but at the same time too, don't, like, you know, use your money in ways that will make you happy. So once you, you know, set aside enough money to actually be, you know, serious and, you know, not in debt or, you know, things like that, and you're, you know, well off or well to do in your life, you have a good education or whatever, you know, honestly use your money in ways that make you happy. Because if you just sit, sit on all your money and you don't use any of it, that can, I think, come back to bite a lot of people. And so anyways, in my opinion, you know, like buy what makes you happy within reason, be responsible, but you know, buy what makes you happy. And so if you do like chasing these hype things, um, then do so. But I think a lot of it is a, just a lot of like marketing um, jargon to really end up putting you into or getting you into things like knives that, you know, are arguably not really any worse or better than, you know, anything else out there. So anyways, guys, hopefully you enjoyed the video. As always, God bless and I'm out.